Jews, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Magi refers to a class of ancient Zoroastrian astrologer priests who once, once lived in the Persian Empire. Now, here's the thing. Do we really know that that's where they came from and that's who they were? Honestly, no. The little bit of information that Matthew gave us about them was this. Magi from the East. Okay. <laughs> We're assuming the Persian area, Persia, because that it, it was, you know, in that direction. Then it says that Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Those two little parts of information in those verses are all Matthew really shares with us about the Magi. So we know that we assume that they were astrologers because they could pinpoint the time the star showed. They were looking to the stars because I don't know about you, but um, I know for myself personally that if I don't like go outside and purposefully look up at night, I don't see any stars. So we have to kind of assume that they were watchers. So they were they were astrologists. Now we also know that that picture of the wise men. You know, you've seen it on Christmas cards where it's the silhouette of them and they're like, it looks like they're traveling and the back, the, the night sky is kind of the backdrop. And it's really beautiful. Our nativity scenes, Christmas plays, we always place wise men around the manger with the shepherds. I put this out the other, um, this past week. There are the wise men with the shepherds, with Mary, with Joseph. That's not really how the story actually went. Now, there are also a number of indications, <coughs> excuse me, that suggest that they arrived quite some time after Jesus was born in the stable. Jesus is no longer referred to as a baby, but as a child. And it refers to the fact that he went to the house. He went to their house. So some people assume that Jesus must have been one to two years old. If you read past those 12 verses, it gets, there's a couple verses that gets quite disturbing because then you will read that Herod wanted to know how long they had been following the star, when, when the star had first appeared. Not because he had any real um, desire to go and worship the child, but he needed to decipher how old, or approximately how old the baby was. Because then after the Magi leave, he goes into Bethlehem and he kills all of the male children who are two and under. But one of the facts that Matthew does give us is that the wise men came with special gifts for the newborn king. The Gospel writer tells us they went into the house when they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They knelt down worshiped him. They brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and presented them to him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, what strange gifts for a newborn child. Some have reason that these gifts are symbols of who the baby was. Gold. Gold is a gift for a king. Perhaps it represents power and wealth. This child, Jesus, is royal and kingly. Frankincense. 
Because this baby is God come to earth. Myrrh. Myrrh was used in embalming the dead. It indicated this child's humanity and foreshadowed his suffering and death as Savior of the world. Now these are popular interpretations of the gifts that the wise men brought. Matthew doesn't give us any explanation why they brought these gifts. He simply gives us the facts. They knelt down and worshipped him. They brought out their gifts and presented them to him. Now to us, these might seem rather useless gifts, but what do you get what do you give this child who is the all-powerful God, who controls the stars to such an extent that a particularly bright star travels westward and stops over the place where Jesus and his parents were living? When the Lord of the universe reaches down from heaven, and touches the earth. Love comes to us in the flesh as one of us, a baby, comes to do battle with Herod and all evil in this world. What do you give? What is the right gift? <laughs> when we consider the greatness of the gift we have been given in Christ the wonder and majesty of it all. What can we give in return? Even the wise men, with their precious gifts, must have realized that their expensive presents were hardly adequate for the child in the manger. The God who had become a human and now rests in his mother's arms. Maybe that's the point. We, like the wise men, are simply blown away by the awesomeness of God's love that led him becoming flesh in a little child. We fall to our knees. We fumble around in our pockets and our purses, our wallets, to find a gift that is worthy of the one we've just been given. But what do we have to give? God's gift to us is just too great, too wondrous for us to find a gift, gift worthy of return. But what can we give in return? All we can do, like those men from the East, thrust forward our ever so humble presence, yet at the same time the best we can offer is bag of gold, the fragrant compromises of frankincense and myrrh. Maybe that's always the way it was with our gifts to God. All the gifts that we offer in worship now, if you have ever heard me pray, you know, first and foremost, I pray for the gifts, right? For the gift of Jesus Christ, for the gifts that God has given to each and every one of us. So all the gifts that we offer in worship, our praise, our music, our singing, I wouldn't call my singing a gift, but okay, let's, <laughs> right? The words of our liturgy, the words we mutter in prayer, the building, the bricks, the glass, the color. Yes, our, our financial gifts, our tithing, all of those are things that we can give. Small gifts in comparison to God's gift, true. All we can do is to offer God the best of what we have at the moment. Right? Now, I don't know about you, I get anxious going through Christmas time. Um, I'm not, um, I'm not a, a big gift giver. I, I, I give gifts to my 
children, you know, um, my spouse gets a gift. Um, I'm not, I don't like to shop. So I'm not, I'm not the typical female who goes into the mall and spends hours. That drives me bananas. I'd rather make a list, go get exactly what's on my list, and then I'm like, I'm out. When my mom used to drag me to the mall, and my dad would go, me and my dad were sitting on a bench, my mom was wandering around the mall by herself. That was before cell phones, so she always got lost. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have, have to wait an extra 30, 40 minutes for her to find her way back to which bench we had, she had parked us on. And then I get that anxiety of, I hope, I hope that nobody else buys me anything. Because then I feel obligated in, in some form or fashion to return, you know, a gift. And I don't know if you've ever watched The Big Bang Theory, but um, there's this scene at Christmas time with Sheldon and Penny. And she told him that she got him a gift and he freaks out because he doesn't want to go through that anxiety and so he makes um he makes uh howard go take him shopping right well he doesn't know what she got him so he doesn't know how big and how expensive of a gift to get because it's got to be equal right so they come back from the store and they're co coming in with all of these gift baskets. <coughs> gift baskets from little to huge and they come in and, and there's three of them and they're all carrying gift baskets. And he puts them in the room and he's got this plan. And she gives him his gift. He's gonna claim that he's got a belly issue. He's gonna, he's gonna leave the living room, go pick out the basket that is equal to what she gave him and then he's going to return the rest of them. So she comes in and he opens, she gives him the gift, he opens it up and it's a napkin. And he's like, you can tell. Sheldon's like, hmm, napkin. <laughs> you know, he's excited. He turns it over, right? And on the other side of the napkin it says, live long and prosper. Leonard B. Moore, right? Or Sheldon's a star Right? So he starts like shaking. He doesn't know what to do. And then he finds out that Leonard Nimoy actually wipes his face off on the napkin. <laughs> so now he's like, now, now the value of that gift just like whew, skyrocketed, right? So he runs back and he comes out and he's got every gift basket that they got. He comes out and he's throwing gift baskets and they're falling all over the place. And she's like, what? And he goes, you're right, it's not enough. It's not enough. So then he goes over and he awkwardly hugs her because he's not a big hugger. But, Though that is a funny situation, and I often have that kind of anxiety when I'm gifted something that I was not expecting, and it doesn't matter how small or big. But his excitement over what she got, which was a really cool gift, I mean, I would be like, Leonard, you're like, that would be pretty cool. I'm going to track these eyes off. <laughs> but his excitement, that's the really cool part, is the excitement. Now, my parents are in their 80s. Actually, today is my mom's birthday. And she is, let me do the math real quick, my head, 86. So she's 86 today. My dad turned to 87 at the beginning of this month. December 5th was his birthday. And for the last 20 years, it's been a struggle on what you get my mom and dad. My dad's pretty easy. Because you get him anything Ohio State, and he's in heaven. And it doesn't matter if he's already got five of them, he doesn't care. He'll take it. I'm sure it wasn't happy about last night's game. We're going to have to pray about that. <laughs> so, but by the time they were in their 60s, anything they wanted, they went and got. Right? So what do you buy people who pretty much, if they want it, they already have? 
And now that they're older, they're they're not they're less mobile, so they don't want to eat and, and do those sorts of things. So gift cards don't really work. And it's been crazy, and so I haven't gotten over there. And we didn't actually see them on Christmas Day, so I, I'm racking my brain. I'm trying to figure out what can we do. What can I get them? And Andrew comes walking through, and I'm like, ha, 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 I got it. So I get Andrew, and we pack up some stuff, and we head over to my mom and dad's house. And we walk in, and, and of course, they're just excited because we were there. The gift of us was enough, which is just a really cool kind of goosebumpy feeling. When you know that the gift of you is enough. But Andrew took his amp and he took his electric guitar. And my parents got front row seats to a very awesome concert. And it, my dad cried. The best gifts that we can offer Christ are the gifts of ourselves. The gold, the frankincense, the myrrh, the wise men are kind of useless to the baby Jesus. But as useless as these gifts are for God, they are a sign of the way the wise men gave of themselves. Here, these men, learned, wealthy, not Jews, probably pagans, kneeling at the tiny toddler's feet of the true God. Even as they pay homage, they would have realized that even the gift of themselves is sometimes far too small for the king of kings. I think we think that. We often feel that the gift of ourselves isn't enough. But the gift of ourselves, given freely, is exactly what God wants from each of us. We're at the end of the year, we're going to be beginning a new one, and often we take this time and we think about all the things that we're going to change, right? Those, those New Year's resolutions. We're going to change all this stuff next year. We're going to, you know, the second we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to eat healthy. We're going to start working out, and we're going to be kinder. And by, what, January 4th, or I'll give you the 10th, January 10th, all that stuff kind of goes out the window, right? I think now is the time when we look back over the year that we just had. And we're going to notice that there were a lot of blue sky days, and there were probably a lot of gray sky days challenge you to thank God for each and every one of them. The gray and the blue. Now the wise men, they went home by another road. We too can walk a different road this year. A road where we can make the King of Kings the living, active center of everything we are and do. The challenge in front of each of us is to make each breathing moment a gift worth giving to a king. God gave himself to us because he loves us. May his love be reflected in our lives as we worship him 